Harper's Whoa, got a little Jim. trouble around that buoy, but able to straighten it out. And she cleans up and comes through the exit gates. Had a little trouble, Wayne, at the second. Slalom, Scott Clack, the world champion freestyle jumper. Dina Brush, the world champion in the women's slalom. And Mike Hazelwood, the tour distance jumping champion. All will be defending their titles in the Orlando Cup, the first stop on the 1985 Coors Light International Water Ski Tour. The USA Network presents exclusive coverage of the 1985 Coors Light International Water Ski Tour from Lake Eola in Orlando, Florida, featuring the world's top competitors in professional water skiing. The 1985 Coors Light International Water Ski Tour is brought to you by Mastercraft, the standard by which all others are judged. Ski Supreme, the leader and innovator of world-class luxury for the demanding skier. And by Coors Light, Coors Light turns it loose with professional water skiing. From beautiful Orlando, Florida, here on the shores of Lake Eola, the greatest water skiers in the world have gathered for the first tour stop of the International Water Skiing Tournament. Beautiful day for water skiing, temperature in the 80s, a little bit of a strong wind blowing here on the lake this afternoon, but nonetheless, the skiers expect some record-shattering performances. Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Slayton, and joining me alongside, as he will be all summer long, former world champion Wayne Grimditch. And Wayne, the attitude, very enthusiastic because of the success of the tour last year. It's carried over into this year. It sure has. We had so many people in the challenge rounds earlier. It was amazing. All the tour champions are returning. It looks to be a great competition. You'll be seeing four events in competition this afternoon, the men's and women's slalom, the men's freestyle jumping, and the men's distance jumping. In the men's slalom, of course, the current world champion, the top seed, Bob LaPointe. Nobody expects to see him lose today. Bobby's pretty tough, but uh, the caliber and depth of talent in the slalom event is really great. Andy Mapp will be right on his heels. And on the women's side, Camille Duval may be the top seed, but I don't think anybody would be wearing a look of surprise if Dina Brush were to sneak in there and win it. Well, Dina is the world record holder, and she's looking very solid. So again, they're renewing their old rivalry. In the men's distance jumping, Mike Hazelwood is the top seed, but the world record holder for distance at 202 feet, Glenn Thurlow has shown up, and he'll give him a run for his money. He sure will. Hazelwood jumped 201 about a couple months or so ago. And uh, he's looking tough, but don't forget Sammy Duvall. He's got a great spring. The crowd favorite in many cases is the freestyle event. And the best freestyle jumper in the world is here at Lake Eola, Scotty Clack. Scotty Clack will thrill, thrill the crowd with his Mobius. That's a full twisting reverse somersault off a five and a half foot ramp at 50 miles an hour. And he lives to tell about it. We'll return to Lake Eola, Orlando, Florida and the start of the 1980. Even though we're both champion water skiers, Paul and I don't seem to have much in common. For instance, I'm married. I like the single life. I like golf. I'm into surfing. I prefer to jump. I'd rather slalom. I'm into rock and roll. Jazz. It seems the only thing these two champions have in common is their choice in water skis. KS graphite. Redline graphite. In the earlier rounds, the big upset occurred when six-seated Mike Hazelwood was able to clear four buoys at 35 off. Third-seated Chris LaPointe then came out and only cleared two and a half at 35 off. So the sixth seed, Mike Hazelwood, advances. Then seventh-seated Eddie Detelder was defeated as expected by second-seated Andy Mapple. Detelder fell after clearing only one half buoy at 39 and a half off. Mapple easily cleared the first buoy at 39 and a half off to advance. Fifth seated Chris Swan defeated by fourth seated Mike Morgan. Morgan clearing two buoys at 38 off. Swan one and a half at 38 off. So Morgan advances. And the top seed, Bob LaPointe, the current world champion, advancing over Lucky Lowe. Two buoys at 38 off for Bob LaPointe. Lucky Lowe, a buoy and a half at 38 off. Wayne, you skied the slalom course. And from a skier's viewpoint, why don't you tell us what you'll see when you're on the water? The slalom course is composed of six gate buoys and four skier turn buoys. While the towboat travels down the center of the course at a constant 34 miles per hour for women and 36 miles per hour for men, the skier must enter the first set of gates. After doing so, he rounds number one, cuts across the opposite side to number two, 
After negotiating all four buoys, the skier must exit the final set of gates to receive credit for the pass. With each successful completion of a pass, the rope is shortened, increasing the difficulty of reaching the buoys. Whoever rounds the most number of buoys is our winner. Having seen the course, now these are the competitors in the men's slalom. Andy Mapple in the water first, and he'll be battling against Mike Hazelwood. Bob LaPointe, the top seed, will go against Mike Morgan. Andy Mapple at 35 off. Turned one buoy at 39 and a half yesterday in order to get into this semifinal round. So he can be pushed that far and still come through very smoothly. He ought to make this pass, shouldn't he, Chris? I think so, but with a tailwind, it, you carry extra speed in the boots. Oh. oh, he's in trouble, and now he's down. So right. Mapple losing it around that second buoy. I think so. I think I might have jinxed him there. I, I think I think we call it uh, right there, and that the tailwind gives you that extra speed at the buoys, and he just got a little too deep. Here's another look. He got a real nice one ball here, good pull through the wakes, and I think he just got a little over aggressive with that tailwind on the second buoy. Usually gets an outstanding turn on his two and four side, that being his good side. A right foot forward skier generally turns better on two and four. Here's number one. Pretty decent turn there, don't you think, Chris? Very nice turn on one. And this is a strong turn here, number two. Really hard to tell. He pulls the rope in nicely, then it tightens up, and his ski tends to go straight. Maybe he got on the back of the ski a little bit too much. I think he just carried a little bit of extra speed in there with a tailwind, and he just turned a little too hard, and then he got pulled out of it. It looked like a real bad fall, but I, those kind of falls usually don't hurt that bad. Mike Hazelwood now needing just two buoys at 35 off in order to advance into the finals in what would be another big upset for Hazelwood. Well, we're seeing probably the benefit of going second, knowing he only needs two buoys. Left foot forward skier gets a great one. Around two, he's gotten it. And there it is. Mike Hazelwood advances into the championship round. The sixth-seeded skier defeated the third-seeded Chris LaPointe. Now the second-seeded Andy Mapple. He's put some numbers up there. He's done a good job in this tournament. He's getting very steady and a tribute to his strength and his training. Mike Hazelwood will move into the championship round either against Mike Morgan, who is the fourth seed, or the top seed at Bob LaPointe. Mike Morgan with his run at 35 off. Now, this is where it's been getting interesting. Hey, Kevin, the wind's kicked up here a little bit, so this is going to be a tailwind 35 off. This is going to be a rough pass. Mike only has a 40-foot line here. Boat speed, 36 miles an hour. He gets a late on one. And doesn't make it through. So, Chris, you called it right on the button. Very difficult pass. Couldn't complete the first buoy, in fact. I think what happens there is that with the tailwind and a little bit of the whip turn we have coming in the course on this end of the lake, it's a little short. You just carry a little extra speed in that first buoy. Here he comes through the gates, trying to slow down, but he looks a little narrow. You can see he goes down course quite a ways there. And he's trying to pull it in and gets over quite far, maybe a little over aggressive because he had too much speed, Chris. I think so. He just he carried that little extra speed, and when you do have that extra speed, you got to pre-turn a little bit harder to kill the speed. He didn't really do that. So one half buoy they give him at 35, and that's like an appetizer for Bob LaPointe coming in here now. That's the advantage of going second. Being the higher seed, all he all he has to do is go around the first buoy and go back to the wake. Bob LaPointe now needing just to complete the first buoy at 35 off to move into the championship. Bob should have no problem getting around one, and afterwards I would think he would try to finish the rest of the course, get a feel of the water conditions. That's what he's doing, Wayne. He's going for it now. Very nice. He didn't mess around with that at all, did he? 35 off through the course for Bob LaPointe and into the championship against the six-seeded Mike Hazelwood. Well, Hazelwood's pulling the string of upsets. Can he do it one more time? That's the question. He's knocked off two and three, and he's got the top seed, Bob LaPointe, left. It'll be interesting. Also, the fatigue factor will come into play here. Now, Mike's been had a little bit more rest than Bob has. I think that's the reason that Bob's electing not to try 38 off. He's entitled to do that if he wanted to. He's going to come in and rest just for four or five minutes, and he'll be right back out in the water again. I'm Kevin Slayton, along with Wayne Grimditch, and we'll be back with more exciting men's slalom action from Orlando, Florida, after this. Experience ski 
Supreme's world-class luxury for the demanding skier. O'Brien Water Skis! What makes O'Brien number one? Innovative, state-of-the-art design, tournament-proven performance, and it's because O'Brien builds excitement in everything they make. Join us in the excitement, O'Brien Water off and he's going in the opposite direction as the other skiers had to take 35 off so that may be an advantage for him. Yes what you have to do here in a headwind situation is pull a little longer through the wakes in order to get enough speed to get out to the buoy. It's a nice one. A little narrow on two he's really have to hustle here. I think yep nice three ball. I think the headwind saved him that was downwind he would have really been in trouble with a bad two ball. But nonetheless Hazelwood is through with 35 off. Earlier we had a chance to talk with Bob LaPointe, the top seed in the men's division, and after setting a new tour and world record last year in the slalom, we wondered about his view for this year. Well, this year's a whole new ball game. Last year I had a real good year, won the tour, but uh, this year's a little different. It's, you know, we're starting from scratch. There's 10 events this year instead of eight, so uh, it's really important that I get off to a good start. He felt the pressure. He certainly threw it aside very casually because he sailed through at 35 off. What's nice about the, the international water ski events is that they do have other forms of water skiing entertainment. They have barefooters out here, hydro sliders, kite flyers. It gives the people an idea of the, of the fun that you can have on a lake with a boat, some skis, or other devices. Derek Hawthorne and Tony Cleric. Hydro sliders, as good as there are around. Putting on a show for the people gathered here in Orlando. And now at 38, this could be the telltale distance as Hazelwood makes his approach 38 off. He's the first skier to give it a try. I think you're right, Kevin. I don't think both skiers will make this pass. Let's see. The rope length here is a half a foot short of the width of the course, making it very difficult to get around the outside of the buoy. Start. He didn't make it around three. He was struggling going around two, so Mike Hazelwood, as Chris LaPointe called it again perfectly, doesn't make it through the course at 38 off. We'll get another look at it. Watch this. Mike has a great start on one, and he does not get out of two well at all, and it causes him to miss three. You don't have much margin of error at 38 off the line. Just a tremendous turn there. Another demonstration of Mike's superior strength. Yeah, he broke forward at the waist, he dropped the handle down in the water, which is you don't want to do, and then he gets forward through the wakes here and it causes him to miss three. Another super turn here. Really sets him up well for number two, but he, he's a he little watched narrow. the handle drop down in the water, and then he breaks forward at the waist, and you don't accelerate away from the buoy right away. It causes him to just barely miss three. He almost got it. They give him two buoys at 38 off. So Mike Hazelwood has put that number up for Bob LaPointe to shoot at, and if he beats it, Bob LaPointe will continue as the slalom champion. If he doesn't, however, Mike Hazelwood's amazing string of upsets will have continued one more. So here's the top seed. Bob LaPointe needs to beat two at 38 off. This is no small feat. He has to get that third boo. He can't be cautious on one and two, or he won't get there in the tailwind situation. I think we remember, though, that Bob has a good turn on number two, so if he gets there, he's got a great chance of getting the number three. Nice two ball. I think he's got it. He might run this. There we go. Yep, he's going for the win, and he gets it. So Bob LaPointe, the champion, as he got around three cleanly, decided to pack it in after that, and he has finally stopped Mike Hazelwood at 38 off. Hazelwood getting two at 38 off. Bob LaPointe doing him a little bit better. Here's another look, Chris. Now, this is his weak side turn, but you wouldn't know it today. He's skiing super on this side. He breaks forward a little bit, but he still gets a good pull away from the buoy, and he comes into a strong turn here. And he just really makes a nice turn. Gets over to three and just takes it easy and goes on around. Great effort from Mike Hazelwood. He extended him, but Bob LaPointe is the champion in the men's slalom. So the six-seated Mike Hazelwood, who had made his way through the force of heavyweights into the championship round, finally runs into a stone wall in Bob LaPointe. Now let's go down dockside to Wayne, who's standing by with the champion in the men's slalom, Bob LaPointe. Wayne? 
Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Bob, your brother Chris is up there telling us that you were out of shape and you might get fatigued out there. Well, it really didn't look like it. Well, you know, the, the more I skied, the better I felt. It's true we got a late start this year because now we've been real busy with the, the ski company and all, but uh, luckily we got a couple early rounds in and I felt stronger as I went along. Mike's a pretty tough competitor, isn't he? He really is, especially in these kind of conditions with the windy conditions, rollers. He's so strong that uh, he can overpower just about anything. Well, you proved your excellence again in Slalom today. Best of luck in the next stop. Thanks a lot, Wayne. These are the results. Bob LaPointe wins it. He officially three buoys at 38 off. Mike Hazelwood coming in second, picking up the 900 points. Andy Mapple and Mike Morgan. We'll return with the start of the men's free... Number four, C. All right, the Freeskylers, the entertaining skiers here in the tournament, and they're ready to go, the four of them, heading out into the water now. Michael Tolsman will be the first jumper that you'll see, and they'll jump in order following Gary McCannisby, Mark Jackson, and then Scott Clack, the top seed. And everybody out here wants to see what Scott Clack is going to be up to this afternoon, but all four of these jumpers, very good, very competitive, and very creative. The freestyle jumping, one of the most entertaining events on the tour, and you can see the point breakdown for each jump, beginning with the helicopter and the reverse helicopter at 35 points. All the way up, you see the back Mobius at 100 points, and that's when it starts really getting exciting. The back Mobius is very exciting. Scotty Clack does it very well. Uh, he has tried the front Mobius, you, there, you see there, 125 points for that maneuver. However, that has not been successfully completed. Then you look down the list there, 175 points for the double back Mobius. Well, I think that one's down the road a little ways. Mike Tolsman with his third jump of the day, attempting a 720, something that we saw Scotty Clack do perfectly earlier in the competition. You see him, he's doing it a little differently than Scotty Clack. He is a double wrap position here, meaning he will not have to hand to hand the rope on the last 360 degree turn. He's taking a straight on approach, springs, there you go. Pulls his knees up under him a little bit, it'll take away from the form, but he lands the jump. Makes it a little easier when he doesn't have to pass that rope back and forth. Once again, he's got the rope wrapped around him twice. He will not have to hand to hand it. They have to be sure to stay right over his skis, almost perpendicular to the water. He sits back a little bit, but it's a nice maneuver. That's a very, very difficult trick. Terry McCannisby with his third jump of the competition. He'll attempt a gainer this time after a helicopter 360 and a front flip. Well, actually, Terry last time substituted the gainer for the front flip. So I would think he might want to do a long front flip, flip this time. He's pulling out wide, meaning he'll get a, a lot of speed to the jump. See what he does. See what he comes up with as he hits the ramp. There we go. It's the long front flip. Whoa! What a great jump. Well, he carried it way out there for distance, yeah. didn't he? Long distance on that jump. You can see here the speed really carries them out there. He's flying on this one flying upside down for a moment. Tucks his skis under, eyes the water. Here he is, he's carrying probably 50, 55 miles an hour of speed, then he tucks his head. This is wild. And he lands, he gets a little turn sideways to the boat, but his skis straighten out on impact. Skis away, he's pretty happy about that. That's a long jump, that should be big points for him. Mark Jackson now with his second jump, a Mobius. And we'll see how he negotiates it. But from a Canisby, that fall will cost him. Well, this is one of the most exciting freestyle, freestyle tricks you'll see. A Mobius, reverse somersault with a full twist. And there we go. No, he decided just to do a gainer. Beautiful, too. Nearly lost control when he hit the water, but he was able to hold on and pull it through. Here's another look at it. Mark Jackson. Edging very solidly to the bottom of the ramp. Throws his head back, twists a slight bit in the air, but he pulls the skis underneath him, comes down, sits back. That'll take away from his form. Nevertheless, he does complete the jump. The top seed, Scott Clack now, attempting his third jump of the competition. What he says will be a Mobius. We'll see if he changes his mind as he approaches the ramp. Scotty's wrapping the rope, cutting across the wakes on his counter cut. 
Looks like he's going through with the Mobius. Now this is a, this will be terrific. He skis on a little longer ski, so watch the rotation. Really beautiful. <laughs> really playing to the crowd. He's juiced up this afternoon, and that was a perfect jump. Well, you can see the contrast between Mark Jackson's and Scotty. Here we go. Scotty has longer skis, gives you a better idea of what sort of contortions he's going through up there. Nice spring off the top, plenty of time. Just spins it around. Boy, he really is talented, isn't he? He's as good as they come. Such a perfect performer. You're watching perfection here. Comes off the end of the ramp, starts to spin, gets a little better spring than Mark Jackson did. Pulls him right around. He loves it. Now that beautiful view from our landmark place camera across the lake. We're up on the roof of their building, and of course, we thank them very much for the use of the building. Mike Tolsman with his fourth and final jump in the water and ready to go at it. A back Mobius is what he's told us he'll attempt on this fourth jump. This will be a difficult one to pull off for Tolsman. Boat speed's about 34, 35 miles an hour. That's selected by the skier. He's wrapped. Looks like he's going to go right through with the Mobius. He's out to the side here. He's eyeing the jump, edging towards it. Really spins it and flips. Boy, oh, he almost pulled out of that. He took a nasty fall, but he's up and waving, so he's all right. Here's another look at it. He came head over heels. Well, he came so close to getting this. It's really a shame because he starts a little early maybe with his turn, but he gets all the way around, just leaning a tad to the left, too far away from the boat. Watch closely here at the top of the ramp. He starts to spin. That throws him off just a little bit. He's not directly over his skis on this landing, so he, he lands hard on the water. His skis jump up in the air and it gets pulled out of shape. But nonetheless, a very valiant effort at that back Mobius. There are his point totals for his four jumps. McAnisby now with his final jump. He'll do a 720. We've seen this performed a couple of times before. Some of the skiers single wrap, some of them double wrap. However, he hasn't wrapped here. It makes me think that perhaps he's going to go maybe for a long distance flip here. Double weight cut. Getting a lot of speed to the ramp carries him a long way. Here we go. Now he's decided to reverse somersault or a gainer. And a rough landing for him after he changed his mind in the water attempt approaching the ramp. And he's not happy with it. And those are the point totals for McCannisby, so he'll finish down in the competition. Now Mark Jackson with his third jump of the day. He'll attempt the gainer. Remember, they'll throw out their worst jump and keep the best three, and that's how they total up the scoring. It looks like he's wrapped and going to do a double weight cut and try his Mobius here. Once again, a reverse somersault with a full twist. Here we go. Keep an eye out for it. There it is. Oh! A rough landing for Jackson. He came up a little short. He could definitely be winded here, although he signifies he's all right with the handshake. Scotty Clack now up in the water. Pre-tournament favorite, the number one seed. And easily the smoothest and most entertaining skier of the day so far. Well, this is very interesting. Does Scotty Clack has written down here that he's going to attempt a 1080. That's three revolutions in the air. This is really, a, really a difficult maneuver. Here what a way go. to pull out for him, though. One, two. Oh! Looks like he only got around in the second rotation, got caught up in the rope. He dropped the rope as he was hitting to the water. Would have been a great flurry for him to finish up on his fourth jump. Would have been fabulous. He really is quite a talented skier. Here he comes off the jump, slips off the side a little, doesn't get the full. You can see there, his tail of the skis caught the, caught the rope and pre prevented him from turning. You'll get a good look here of the rope catching in the ski as he comes off the ramp. Watching the second revolution here is there, there it is, right there. That stops his revolution, pulls one of his skis off for him as well. Scotty Clack coming in after his fourth and final jump of the competition, and those are his point totals. Gets shut out on the last one, but he'll throw that one out and take the other three. Now let's go dockside, where Wayne is standing by with a victorious freestyle jumper, Scott Clack. Wayne? 
Thank you, Kevin. Scotty Clack, you're the class of the freestyle event. That Moby is setting the crowd wild. Now, how long did it take you to learn that? Uh, gosh, I worked on it for about a week and a half on trick skis, and uh, then I just went over and tried it on the long skis, and I picked it up really quick. Uh, it looks terrific. What about the 1080? Uh, I've I've made them on short skis off a little bit smaller ramp. We call a kicker ramp. It's uh, shorter in, in height and uh, shorter in length. And um, a lot shorter skis than I've got now. These are 70-inch mm -hmm. skis. So, but uh, I figured I'd try it today. What the heck, you know? Well, it was a great try. Stay healthy. Congratulations again. Thanks again, Mike. Thanks a lot. Back up to you, Kevin. Thank you very much, Wayne. So let's recap for you the standings and the results in the freestyle competition. Scott Clack, as everyone expected, comes in first by a long shot. Mike Tolsman, who was seated fourth and second. Then Jackson and McCannis be third and fourth. The Coors Light International Water Ski Tour. For the great enthusiasm and support of the people of Orlando. And this tournament taking place in the shadow of Orlando's exciting downtown where famous Church Street Station with its Cheyenne Saloon and Rosie O'Grady's has sparked the renaissance of shopping, theater, and dining. But there's more to Orlando and surrounding Central Florida. Disney World, Sea World, Circus World, Wet n' Wild, and many others. They're the hotels and motels priced for every budget, some of which are attractions all in themselves. Come to Orlando. Go for the magic. Orlando. Go for the magic. Go have the time of your life. And now we're ready for the start of the women's slalom final competition. Camille Duval, Dina Brush, Karen Roberge, and Jennifer Leachman, the top four seeds in the final round. It's going to be very important for Karen to get a good start here. She pulls out wide, comes in with a lot of speed, a little slack rope there. She's going to be late for number two. Oh, she gets a great turn. She's in trouble, but she's a fighter, and she's going to make it. Karen Robert looked as though after round, the second, as she rounded the second buoy, as so she may fall. She lost her balance, but was able to regain her poise and then sail through the course. It looked like she didn't have trouble at all once she got to the fourth buoy. So the pressure now is on Dina Brush at 35 as Karen successfully sails through the course at 35 off. And now Dina Brush has to match her. She has to get through the course unscathed. Karen's really put the pressure on Dina. Dina comes in at number one. Oh, oh she lost it around the first buoy. Dina brushes down in the water around the first buoy. I'm not sure what happened, Wayne, but she seemed to lose her balance. And once she did that, she hit the water and she will be eliminated at 35 off. When the rope gets short to 35 off, leaving the skier only a 43 foot rope. Again, the buoys are 37 and a half feet from the center line of the course. Uh, number one is critical. So Dina Brush upset here in the first semifinal. The second seed is out of the competition, and Karen Roberts will now advance into the final round. Jennifer Leachman into the water at 35 off. This, remember, is where Dina Brush hit the water and couldn't recover. She's so on Jennifer a Jennifer Leachman now, the fourth seed, challenging Camille Duval at 35 off. A first buoy is important here. She's not a good number one. She's coming late to two. Gets straightened out. She's not going to make three. So Jennifer Leachman gets in at one and a half at 35 off. And now going second, Camille Duval will know what she needs to do. She's coming through the gates here. She looks a little narrow, perhaps a little, little tentative on one. She straightens up. You see her ski rears back, and then she straightens out. She loses her angle coming across the wake. She comes very narrow into two. And she's on her bad side. She's a left foot forward skier. It makes it more difficult for her to turn on two. And you can see there, she just couldn't hold on, and she straightened out and misses number three. So now the advantage, they give her two buoys at 35 off. Jennifer Leachman down at two, and Camille Duval needs only to get two and a half in order to advance into the finals against Karen Robert. And here she comes. This is her shot at advancing to the finals. She needs to survive two and a half buoys in order to make it in. Camille won't be going all that hard, I don't think, on number one here, just to make sure she gets around two. And now she'll work very hard to get the three. Is she going to make it? Oh, she's going to get, a, I she think, probably a half there. buoy. She didn't have any room to spare on it, but Camille Duval will enter the championship round against Kara Roberts. She nearly lost it cutting back across the wake, Wayne. 
It's, it's official. She has two and a half buoys, so she betters Jennifer's score by a half a buoy and will advance to the finals. So 35 off was the telling point for both skiers. This is the benefit of going second. You know what you have to do. Here she gets an average number one. Again, she gets straightened up, loses her angle, so she's not very wide for two. You can see she holds her edge there a long ways before she switches over. Late getting her hand on the handle, slack rope, but she continues to pull very hard. She tried to get a round three and get an extra half a buoy to win that pairing. So Camille Duval, as everyone expected, the top seed advancing into the final against Karen Robert's the third seed who upset Dina Brush in the other semifinal. We would be remiss if we failed to thank the tour judges led by the chief judge, Tony Baggiano, Mary Gail Holcomb, Beverly Owen, C.W. Lowe, all of the people that do such a fine job, Stan and Donna Switzer, Reg Barnes, Art Kozier, Jeff Clark, all here doing a great job all weekend. Carol Lowe, Jack Walker, and Bob Long. So our thanks to them for helping to make this the spectacular tournament that it is. Karen Robert's into the water at 32 off. The 22-year-old who shocked everyone by beating Dina Brush to get into the semifinals. Let's see what she can do at 32 off now. She's an Orlando hometowner, and they like seeing her ski out here at Lake Eola. And here she comes easily through the first Whoa, two. Had a little yeah. trouble around that buoy, but able to straighten it out. And she cleans up and comes through the exit gates. Had a little trouble, Wayne, at the second buoy. Yeah, she got over a little bit too far, and it, it looked like she might not be able to hang on to it, but she did. She's a fighter, as I mentioned earlier. And she makes a successful pass at 32 feet off the line, puts the pressure on Camille Duvall now. Well, it's that kind of determination that's gotten her this far. Camille Duvall now at 32 off needs to get through the course without any problem. I mentioned Karen nearly fell into the water in her semifinal round with Dina Brush, but was able to hold on and get through the course. So uh, once again, her intense competitiveness has enabled her to get through the course without a problem. Looks like Camille's gonna have no problem with this pass. She skied it more smoothly than Karen did. Looking very strong at 32 off is the top seeded Camille Duval. I think she might have skied that pass better than the one prior. She might be really getting warmed up here. So both women threw at 32 off, and now it'll be 35 off, which spelled defeat in each of the semifinal rounds. You're looking at the pleasure craft motors that power these boats to pull the skiers out on the lake. PCM engines in nine out of 10 world-class tow boats and used by 80% of the major inboard manufacturers. The PCM engines are in nine out of 10 ski shows in the United States. The Pleasure Craft Motors powering the boats here at Lake Eole in Orlando this afternoon. Karen Robert's at 35 off. She was able to get through easily at 35 off in her semifinal round with Dina Brush. Let's see if she can duplicate that and you get the feeling that she'll need to as she is going to win this championship. She's on a 40-foot rope, not much rope to get around the outside of the buoys. Has a nice turn on number two. Oh, she's late for three. They could not make four. So Karen, unlike in her semifinal round with Dina Brush, is not able to get through the course at 35 off. And now with three buoys at 35 off, it's right on the table for Camille Duval. She simply has to beat three. Take another look at it here. Number one was fair, and she's pulling hard to two. Now, number two, I thought she got a pretty good turn, but she got a lot of slack rope, and it, she skied down course too far. She was late for three and just couldn't uh, manage to make it up. A lot of skiers wouldn't have made it to that third buoy, but she stayed in there even with the slack on the rope. She was scrambling all the way, and it finally caught up to her. The top seed, Camille Duval, needs to beat three buoys on this run. She's gonna have her work cut out for her here. The rope is short, they have to, go. Oh! oh! she lost it. She lost it around the first buoy. And a stunning upset, Karen Roberts is the champion in the women's slalom as the top seeded Camille Duval failed to clear the first buoy cleanly. Camille obviously disappointed with this. We'll take another look. She angles through the gates. Number one is very important here. She stretches, gets forward on the ski, starts her turn, grabs the handle, finishing her turn, gets a little slack, and I don't know, it looked like it just popped out of her hand here. It's hard to tell with all the spray from the ski. And so Karen Robert is the champion. 
a different angle might tell us what happened. Again, she gets a pretty good turn. She pulls in, and she just couldn't hang on to it once the rope tightened. You can Obviously see the frustration point. from the top-seated Camille Duvall, but there is the champion, Karen Robert. She wins the women's slalom, the 22-year-old hometowner here in Orlando. And now let's go down dockside as Wayne has got the champion of the women's slalom with him, Karen Robert. Wayne? Thank you, Kevin. Karen, terrific job. I mean, you took out Dina, and then you took out Camille, one right after the other. How do you feel about it? Uh, I feel great. I really, I felt strong out there today. I really felt like I could do it, and today was the day, so I went out there and skied the way I wanted to. The water didn't look too bad from up here, but you say it's kind of bumpy. Yeah, there's a really strong tailwind going into 32 off, so I had to really hold back a bit. But behind these boats, you really got to edge hard into the buoys. Well, terrific job. Best of luck in the future. Thank you very much, Wayne. Thank you very much, Wayne, and congratulations to Kara Robert, who upsets the top two seeds en route to the victory in the women's slalom. A thousand points for her. Camille Duval, who was the top seed, comes in second. Jennifer Leachman, third, and Dina Brush, fourth. There's America's playground for the rich and famous. Palm Beach County claims the warm South Atlantic shoreline with a 47 mile ribbon of some of Florida's finest beaches. The near subtropical climate is influenced by the Gulf Stream to maintain an average mean temperature of 74 degrees. Palm Beach, where fishing is great and golfers call home, is the perfect setting for the world champions of the International Water Ski Tour to battle an exciting competition. That's right, Kevin, and after we leave Palm Beach, it's on to Lake Lanier and Atlanta, Georgia. Then we head west to Firebird Lake in Phoenix, Arizona, and then continue on to the west coast and marine world of California. And now we're ready for the finals of the men's jump competition. You know, a skier doesn't just approach the ramp and jump over it. It's not quite that easy. And Wayne, maybe you can explain some of the elements that the skier must keep in mind as he approaches the ramp. In the jumping course, the boat travels to the right of the jump, parallel to the surface of the jump, at a constant 35 miles per hour. While in the course, the jumper makes two cuts. The first, the counter cut, beginning approximately at the 500-foot buoy, the jumper cuts hard to his right, swinging him to the right side of the boat, opposite the driver. At this point, he makes his final cut to the ramp, reaching speeds of 60 to 70 miles per hour. The skier springs off the end, and it's these two ingredients, speed and spring, which gives the jumper his distance. Mike Shaylander now into the water for his second jump of the day, second of three. And again, 167 feet to mark the beat. He went 157 on his first jump. So we'll see what he learned from the conditions of the water and the ramp on his first jump as he approaches for number two. Pay close attention to his body position at the bottom of the ramp here. That's critical to get a good spring off the ramp. Once again, it was not ideal. Consequently, he came off the ramp with his bent knees. The skiers call that crushing. Didn't get quite the height he would have liked here. Uh, he's just a little off here. He's a little back. He's a little late with his spring because of that and he crushes at the top of the ramp. Once again, crushing is the bending of the knees or the back off the top of the ramp. 169 feet for Shaylander. Furlow with his second attempt of the day. He's got the top jump so far, and he's the third jumper into the water. He'll try to best 171. And you get the feeling that he's ready to push today. I really do. I think Lenny's pretty pumped up here. He's got a nice tailwind, holds the skier out there wide. He's slowing down just a little bit, but he usually edges very well right there. Nice spring. Really has good form in the air. Looks very similar to the first jump in which he traveled 171. We'll wait and see, but another good jump nonetheless. For Thurlow, 174 is the official total on that one. So he did indeed top his first jump by three feet. Len was sitting back there a little bit at the bottom of the ramp, which causes him to sit back even more after he comes off the end. The ideal position at the bottom of the ramp is for the skier to stand almost straight up and down perpendicular to the water. That's hard to believe, but if you keep a very sharp eye, you can see that position. Now he has to keep in mind that he's only got two opportunities remaining to supplant Glenn Thurlow, who jumped 174 feet. That's the number he has to beat. Three have gone by without passing it. Only two are left. We're looking at one of the best skiers in the world, if not the best, in jumping and in overall. Good cut. Misses his spring a little bit. Sammy usually has a terrific spring off the jump, probably the best in skiing today. And this time he goes 172, so he got out there close, 
but still does not pass Thurlow's 174. He needs a real good finisher. Well, you can see how much speed he had. He went 172 with really only a half spring, so he carries a lot of speed to the bottom of the ramp, which he really isn't known for. He's really known for his spring, and that's what it, he emphasizes in his jumping. It's on the line for Sammy Duvall. His final jump needs 174 or better. I would think Sammy would be thinking about getting a, a good hard spring off the top of the ramp this time. He's out there wide again, make a final cut to the ramp, building a lot of speed, 60, 65 miles an hour. Better spring, I think that might do it. He got way up there, he thinks he did it. You can see there he has so much speed on the land, he's really got a snow plow so he doesn't run up onto the beach there. Again, he jumps the wake, which is really not ideal, but he still regains his position, gets a good lift, not the best lift for Sammy, but that just might do it. He was out there for a long time, 182, so there's your new leader. Sammy Duvall with a 182-footer that beats Glenn Thurlow. He had the mark at 174, so Duvall with just one jumper to come is the current leader, but that one jumper is Mike Hazelwood. Second run for the top seed, Mike Hazelwood. 171 on his first jump. It's going to be an important jump for him, I think, Wayne, because that second one is either going to be a confidence pillar for him or it's going to really put him down a notch. Very much so. Mike's out very wide in front of the boat. He starts wider than most of the skiers, slows down, makes his turn, really cuts nicely through the wakes, but he's back too far and doesn't get quite the extension he did on the previous jump. He's going to come down to his final jump. You know, this is a classic rivalry between Hazelwood and Duvall, uh, and it's interesting because both have contrasting styles. Here, Mike has a very strong cut. That's what he really works on. He has kind of a resisting type spring. He really doesn't get very good spring on that one. And Sammy really works hard on his spring, and he has an excellent one. It's a nice feel for the jump. 171 feet for Hazelwood. So he's going to have his work cut out for him on his final jump. He's got to go 183 feet. It all rests on this jump, on the shoulders of this man, Mike Hazelwood. If he goes better than 182, he's the champion. If he does not, Sammy Duvall is. Simple as that on the final jump of the day. I think you'll see Mike really bear down on the cut here, try to keep his skis down through the wake. He's really digging in now. Boy, a lot of speed. He's out there pretty far. I don't know. It's going to be close. I don't think he made it. I think it's going to fall short. He just didn't quite get the lift off the ramp he usually does. We'll wait for the official word, but Mike Hazelwood on his final jump, giving it his all. Here we see Mike. The ski's flying up again. When that occurs, it sets the skier back a little bit. Mike never really transfers his weight over his skis. And he misses his spring, and I think he's going to fall short. 174 is the official verdict on his final jump. So Sammy Duvall, the champion here in the distance jump at 182 feet. A big win for Sammy, and he does it in front of the hometown folks, the native of Orlando, and Sammy Duvall is the champion today. The finals of the men's distance jumping, Sammy Duvall with a jump of 182 feet is the champion. Did it on his last jump. Mike Hazelwood in second, Glenn Thurlow third, and Mike Shalander finishes fourth. And now let's go dockside where Wayne is standing by with a champion, Sammy Duvall. Wayne? Thank you, Kevin. Sammy, you left it to your last attempt. That's kind of nerve-wracking, isn't it? It wasn't my favorite way to do it, but I'm just happy I came out with that 182. How were the water conditions out there? They didn't look too bad from up here, but some of the skiers were saying it's pretty pretty bumpy. Well, with the wind at your back like it is, it was really tight down on the 600-foot buoy, and it made it really tough to get wide and then try to slow down. And you notice that one jump I had rough water on. It's a good thing it was rough water because I wouldn't have been able to slow down the turn. Well, congratulations again. Best of luck in the next stop. I'm looking forward to it. Back to you, Kevin. Earlier, Wayne mentioned the first part of the tour calendar, and here's the rest. June 29th and 30th, we'll be at the Lake Cumberland Classic in Somerset, Kentucky. Then the tour goes on to Dayton.